Lord, Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath. And Father, we thank you for the meaning of the Sabbath, of resting in your Son's perfect and finished atonement. And Father, we uh, ask that you'll be with us this morning as we open your word, and we ask for the Holy Spirit to be the teacher. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we are on chapter 8, verse 18, and one of these days we're going to get past this verse. <laughs> we're taking our time. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. So the glory that is to be revealed, uh, Paul is looking toward the second coming, the hope of the gospel the consummation of the whole plan of salvation. Last week, I went a little bit off course, but still with the lesson, and explained uh, inaugurated eschatology, realized eschatology, and consummated eschatology. And eschatology just means the study of last day events, so if you're clear on that. Uh, this may have been a little bit over your heads, but it's really not that complex. It just means that basically, as far as we are in this world, presently, uh, God has transferred what's true in the future to be real of us when? Now. In other words, where does judgment belong? It actually belongs at the absolute end of time. That's where the judgment belongs. Christ inaugurated the judgment at the cross, is when he inaugurated it. In other words, what happened to sin at the cross? It was all dealt with at the cross. So what God does to us in the present is that the verdict that would be at the end of time, the very end of time, is the verdict that we have right now in this life. In other words, if I am in Jesus Christ, I have been judged where? In Jesus Christ. Therefore, Paul tells us we no longer have a fear of of a future judgment is what he says because we are already living with the verdict of what? Of acquittal. That's, this is what, uh, th this really what it winds up meaning on that. So this is things to realize about ourselves. So this is who we are, what we are, and where we are in Jesus Christ right now. This is how God regards us. He regards us as we are in his son. And that's how he sees uh, us in this. So I'm not going to go back over this again unless there's some questions on this uh, detail. So we're going to move on with uh, about the second coming. And what Paul is wanting us to realize in, in this verse is that this is an important part of the New Testament teaching. It's an in essential part of the comfort and consolation that the Christian alone can know and experience in a joy. That's why all three parts are very important. The gospel, the fruit of the gospel, and the hope of the gospel. And the second coming is the hope of the gospel. It is not the hope of the unbeliever. Neither is the fruit of the gospel for the unbeliever. These two things are only for the believer. The gospel is for who? Everybody. Everybody, period, the gospel is for. But the fruit of the gospel are those who believe, because to have the fruit, you have to have what? the Holy Spirit. You have to have the power. The unbeliever does not have that, see. And the hope of the gospel is the second coming of Christ. And that's only for the believer because the unbeliever is going to be crying for the rocks to fall on him. 
in the, when, the, when Christ comes. So that's why the hope of the gospel is very important. We need to be always focusing on that. You know, sometimes we lose our focus on that. We forget about the hope of the gospel, the second coming of Christ, looking forward to this. One thing I'll tell you as you get older, I think your focus starts to focus a lot more there on the hope of the gospel as we get older because we really start to long for it. You know, we really do. And we really want to get rid of this tent that we have. We really do. Uh, because we're getting tired <laughs> as we get older on this. Young people don't quite see it that way. So I want to share a few passages this morning in Scripture regarding the Second Coming, and I'm going to kind of show you uh, realized eschatology and consummated eschatology in these passages. So first of all, Matthew 19, 25, 27 and 28. Matthew 19, 27 and 28. Then answered Peter and said to him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said to them, Verily I say to you that you which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon twelve throne, thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So the, when he talks about the regeneration here, what is he talking about? He's talking about the second coming. He's talking about consummated eschatology. In other words, the end, the wrap-up, the finished product. In other words, what he's talking about here. And then in my, uh, you'll find these, uh, the whole of Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. Uh, you'll find all of this. The, Mark 13 and Luke 21, the same thing uh, about the, the uh, second coming. Uh, so he holds before them the glory which is coming. He keeps on holding it before them. John 14, 1, we all know this passage. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So these are some of the promises that we have. In, the New in fact, the New Testament is just full of these promises of the second coming. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So it's, it's a real coming that we're looking forward and what we're going to see. And then again, um, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will keep you sperm unto the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who keeps our salvation, folks? God does. We do not. Sometimes we hear it said that once we're in, once we're saved, it's up to us to maintain our salvation. That's not scriptural, folks. Now, we do cooperate in this, but it is God who is keeping us. In fact, in the passage, uh, 1 John 1, 9, if you understand the context to the passage, it is a passage of power, it is a passage of hope, not of fear. Because when the, when the phrase, blood of Jesus, is used in the New Testament all the way through, it means justification. So if we keep on confessing our sins... What is God faithful and just to do? To cleanse us and to forgive us. 
if we keep on confessing is in the, in the present indicative active. His cleansing is an hour's tense. If you go back to verse 7 in 1 John, you will see that he's talking about two different kinds of sin. One is where we don't even know that we may be sinning at all. What keeps that cleansed? The blood of Jesus. In 1 John 1, 9, it's talking about when we deliberately and willfully fall. Occasionally, is what it's saying there. But all that time is we are habitually walking where? In the light. We're walking in the light. You do not go in and out of the light. You don't, one day you're not in the light and the next day you're in darkness, see. John uses the present indicative active in both of these verses in 6 and 7. And what he is saying is that the unbeliever habitual, habitually structures his whole lifestyle in the sphere of darkness. That's where he lives. And the believer, his lifestyle is in the sphere of light, and that's where he lives. And he, can, he may fall into sin walking in the light. What exposes that sin? It's because he's walking in the light. That's why the, the sin is exposed. It's brought to our attention. is because he is walking in the light in the light. If he was walking in darkness, there would be no exposure of that sin at all. So that's why this, this verse is powerful. But then what John is saying in this verse is that because we are walking in the light and because when we do fall and we confess, he is true and faithful to his own character. What has he already done 2,000 years ago on the cross? He has already forgiven you that sin. He is just and faithful. He cannot do otherwise. See, he's already forgiven you that sin. Past, present, and future. That's why this is so important that we see the context of the letter when we are studying a letter. And John's context is positive. John's context of First John is power when he is writing. It's not in the context of fear, it's in the context of fellowship. And John says we know something about ourselves. He tells us that if we are believers, we know something about ourselves, and what we know is that we are of God. That's what he tells us, that we know that we are of God. And that we know that we have what? Eternal life. And John says, he writes this, that your joy may be filled full, it's a perfect tense, that your joy may be filled full, and that it will remain running over, is what he's saying in, in 1 John there. So it's a powerful little book when you, when you really look at that. That's why be very careful of taking a context over here, and a context here, and then another context, and forcing it into this context. See, you can't do that when you're studying scripture. This author has to allow you to do that. If that author doesn't allow you to do that, you can't do that on that. So you have to realize that there's different contexts on these passages, and you better know what the contexts are when you're studying them. Otherwise, you can't do that, because then you're actually creating something that really the author had nothing in mind on that. That's why I say that the Gospel of 1 John is written 
for believers, and it's, it, what John is trying to show them is what their position is while they're living in this uh, awful world, what their position really is in Christ. John and Paul are very much on the same page. The only difference between John and Paul is that Paul is much further educated and he's got a logical brain. He's got a lawyer's brain. John doesn't have a lawyer's brain. John is so much more simple and down to earth and more practical in how he approaches things. And so they both use different imagery. Paul uses different imagery. John does. John's number one imagery is light and darkness. Now that's the difference. Paul uses realms and kingdoms and you know all these different type of pictures. But they but they're saying the same thing. They they actually teach exactly the same message. There's nothing different in what they're saying. Okay. Uh, and there's a few other passages I wanted to read here. Okay, in the uh, 14th verse of chapter 8 of Romans, it says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And then it goes on to say that... Um, no, I've got the wrong text here. It's Ephesians. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse uh, 13 and 14. Uh, we are not to stop with forgiveness and justification, nor even with sanctification. We are to look forward to this glory which is yet to be revealed. In uh, Ephesians chapter uh, 1, verses 13 and 14, it says that we have something in this life, and that is realized eschatology. Who is living inside of us? The Holy Spirit. That's realized eschatology. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the earnest or the down payment on this. So this is what you would call realized eschatology. In other words, we already have a piece of this, is what Paul is saying here, uh, as we go through life. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the down payment. He is the guarantee that one day I will be here. See, at, at the consummation of all this. And I'll be on the right side <laughs> in that consummation of all this. This is what the Holy Spirit is guaranteeing. So that's a perfect example of uh, realized and consummated uh, eschatology there. Philippians 1 6, being very confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you, realized eschatology, will perform it until the day of who? Jesus Christ, consummated eschatology. See, this is all through these. Hmm? Uh, 1 6, yes. In other words, that's what we can realize. Another passage that is very, uh, a passage that means a lot to me is in Second Epistle to Timothy, chapter 1, verse 12. And Paul says this, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. What have I committed to Jesus Christ? My salvation. My eternal life. I have committed that to Jesus Christ. Are you, am I, persuaded that he's able to keep that which we've committed to him? See, that's what... Paul is saying, we should be able to realize that. See, these Bible writers are not talking about doubt, folks. They are not talking about, about John doesn't talk about doubt. In fact, when it comes to fear, what does John say about fear? Chapter 4 of 1 John, he talks about perfect love cast out fear. Look at the context, folks. It's the judgment. 
If we are in Christ, we have no fear of what? The judgment. Yes. We have no fear of this at all. Hallelujah is right. Absolutely hallelujah. And then another verse, it says, uh, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, for the, uh, teaching us to say no to ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, and the appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, you see both of those aspects there, what, what you are presently and what you will be uh, in the future. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time, apart from sin unto salvation. That's Hebrews 9.28. Christ dealt with sin where, folks? At the cross. When he comes the second time, he's just coming to pick us up. That's really what Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is saying. He's not dealing with sin now. He's dealt with it. He has taken care of it at the cross. And that is when the heavenly sanctuary was actually cleansed was at the cross. I know that I'm in hot water with a lot of people over this, but I have to stand on Scripture. That's where I stand, is on Scripture and Scripture alone. <clears throat> yeah. Now, there is a consummation part to it. I'm not denying that. In other words, when God does what with sin, yes, he's going to take it out of the universe. He's going to wipe it out of existence. Absolutely. But I'm talking about as the believer is in relationship to all this. See, it has been dealt with. Colossians chapter 2 says that my record has been what? Blotted out. My record has been blotted out. As far as I'm concerned, my record, according to the Bible, is blotted out. If that record is not blotted out, f folks, you could never have any assurance of salvation. If you think you have assurance of salvation, all you're doing is deceiving yourself. Yes. Yes. When was your name put in the book of life? Do you know? Scripture says before the foundation of the world. Wow. <laughs> before the foundation of the world. Oh, yes. That's foreknowledge. He knows that. That doesn't mean that he has predetermined that. There's a difference there. But he knows that, yes. But our names, according to Scripture, was, is, is, was put in the book before the foundation of the world. Yes. That's why it would be a big deal if you reject Jesus, see. Yes. Yes. Because he's already saved you. See, that's the whole point. That's, that's a fact. But remember, when Christ died, he died for how many? All. His death covered how many? Everyone. But because he creates you with free will and because God is love, you have to choose. You have to say yes or no. No, it doesn't. No. And, and so if you, and, and one thing you need to realize, no one will ever be lost because he wasn't saved. He will be lost because he rejects the salvation, the gift. See, 
The issue in the judgment now is not the law. The issue in the judgment is not sin. The issue is in the judgment is, what are you going to do with my son? Because the son has taken care of it all. Yes. In fact, you remain under condemnation if you reject it. That's what John tells us in John 3.36, I believe it is. That you remain in that state, see, if you reject the gift. It's all hinged upon what are you going to do with Jesus Christ because Jesus is the one who has taken care of the sin problem. He has dealt with the sin problem. And so what are you going to do with him? See, if you reject him, then you have nothing. You are where you always were. You're still in your sins. And you're going to wind up in the lake of fire, according to the scriptures. Because that will be your choice. God has made it so that no one ever has to wind up in the lake of fire. Is what he has done. That's the good news of the gospel. He's made that. That's what he's done. And the only reason anybody ever will is because they have refused the gift of Jesus Christ. They do not want him, see. It is tragic. It is very tragic. In other words, when one of the things that is, that is in this great controversy is the vindication of God. When this is all over with, the whole universe will see that God did everything without any exception, to save every human being that has ever existed or ever will exist. He has already, you know, taken care of that. In other words, God vindicates himself by what he has done through this plan of salvation, is how he vindicates himself on that. Okay, so we are... And another passage I'd like to share before we go to off of this is 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Now, who's keeping you? God. How is he keeping you? Through faith is how he is keeping you. And some of your other translations, that's from the King James. Others will say guarded, protected, whatever they use. The same meaning is what it really is in, in the other translation. But this is what this verse is saying. So this is important for us to see what God is doing with and in his people. This, this is realized eschatology here. That's what we need to understand. This is how God sees you right now in his son. And that is going to be ending up here. See, that isn't going to change, in other words. That's not going to change. The only way that could ever change is if you gave up Jesus Christ. That's the only way that that could ever change. And one author has brought out in a couple of different writings, and that is, it would be very difficult for that to happen. In other words, in one place, she says that you cannot slip and slide into hell. In other words, he has done what? He has put up roadblocks all along the road to stop it. The other uh, statement says that the only way that you're going to get out of Jesus Christ is you're going to have to throw him on the ground and trample him underfoot. That's what she brings out on that. So that's why I say once you're in, you're in. That's 
what the Bible is saying <laughs> there makes it very clear because it's God who is maintaining our salvation. He doesn't main it, maintain it apart from us. We cooperate with him, but he is the one that's maintaining our salvation. In other words, we have now been, God has moved us from one kingdom into another kingdom. He moved us from this kingdom into this kingdom. Now there is a new head over this kingdom, this new kingdom. And that head has promised to keep me, see. So I'm not trusting in anything that Jerry Williams can do. I'm believing my head. My head says that he's going to take me through. That's where I keep my eyes focused always, is on Jesus Christ. He's the one that has promised to do this with us. Okay, this second coming is going to be a real manifestation of of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, he will come back bodily. He will come back visibly. He will come back very noisily. Uh, he will not come back as a mere appearance. He will come back in his glorified body and every eye will see him. He will be visible, openly visible. The word implies the personal, visible, bodily return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't see anything secret about this when we look at Scripture. Two, two little verses is where they get it. But that is another thing we were just talking about, taking a context and forcing a context into a verse, see? And we have to be very careful of that. Remember, we're all biased. I totally agree with Kevin on this. We are totally all biased. We are all prejudiced. And, we're, and it's, it's a twofold thing. We have our own personal biases and prejudice when we come to Scripture. And secondly, we have, if we are a member of any kind of denomination, we have a denominational bias when we come to Scripture. When you come to Scripture, you have to pray that the Holy Spirit will lay both of these biases aside when we study Scripture. Because God is trying to reach us and trying to teach us, see. And sometimes these biases block the road in doing that. And, and we all have that. I don't care what denomination you come from, you will have a denominational bias when you come to Scripture, whatever it is on that. And that is very true. That is one of, that's one, a part of our sinful fallen condition, is this biased perception when we come to Scripture. And it, it's actually a roadblock when we do that. Okay, and then um, Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Paul is saying that the glory is already there. It's already there. It's not something that's going to be created at the last event in history. It's already there. In other words, it would be like if you were going to a theater and the curtains are pulled at the theater, and all of a sudden they are thrown back, and what is there is already there. It's revealed. And now we see it, is what Paul is saying with this. So the glory is already there. It is not to be created. It is not something that is yet to be produced. The glory is there. What will happen is that this glory will be revealed. It will be made manifest it will be shown. Our Lord himself taught this very thing in Matthew 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Remember, all of this was where? It was all in eternity, folks. That's hard for us to realize. But the whole plan, God's love, all of this was there from eternity. 
It just didn't start at one single point in history. See, it was there from eternity, all of this. Because God foresaw that this would happen. And so he was ready for it. Let's put it that way. It wasn't something that hit him and then he had to come up with a plan of some kind. It was, he was there ready for it from the very beginning on that. So what is the position of the Christian? It is that we believe and must believe this hope of the gospel, the second coming. Because that is where Paul is saying is that this is where we get our comfort when we are going through sufferings and trials in our life. We are not like the unbeliever where the, the world is, that's, that's it. There's no time. The Christian has, uh, can see that there's this age and an age to come. It's the age to come that is where the, future, where the hope is, see. Not in this life. Where the unbeliever, that's all he has is this life. So there's no hope for him because many people, they die without, they believe that once they die, that's it. They're gone forever. There, there's no more existence. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you're right, Gary. That, that's why a lot of people go headlong into sin, you know, make it a really good uh, time, you know, one, one time around, in other words. That's why they do that. Others will, and that would probably be what I would do, is why? Why go on? You know, see, if you didn't have that hope. Because if, if this was all there was, folks, think about it. Think about it. Would it be worth it? See? Yes, yes. Because that's, you've got a different kind of life in you, see. <laughs> that's what First John is talking about. You have a different kind of life in you, see. And that life is what makes a difference in you. But if you didn't have that, see, you didn't have any of that, I mean, this is not that pleasant of a world to live in, especially as you grow older. You know, and then you see all these atrocities that happen throughout the world with little kids and so forth. I mean, it's not that easy to, to handle if we did not have this hope in Jesus Christ. That's where it is, folks, is in Jesus Christ. That, that's where the hope is and always will be, is in him, not in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, and don't lose your mind over it either <laughs> because you're not going to get a, a full answer on it. Yes, but, but there is no love without free will. So God in his sovereignty, which out of his love, what did he do? He limited his love. In other words, he limited himself, is what he did. He limited himself, not his love, but himself, is what he did. And he created his creation with what? Free will. Well, when you, when you give the gift of free will, what are you doing? You're, you're gambling, aren't you? Aren't you taking a chance that there is a possibility that someone's going to go off track? But see, it was because, see, he could have said no. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, but, but where, where do you draw the line between guiding and force, see? See, God cannot force your will in any way. He does not use this kind of... Satan can use that method, but God cannot. That is not part of him. So when he did this, by, by making that decision is one of the clearest evidences of his love. Because love, one of the characteristics of love is love takes a risk. See, when, when you go out and you start dating, if I was going to go out and date a girl, and I fall in love with this girl, 
am I not taking a risk? Is there a chance that she might not reciprocate? See? See, the love takes that risk on that. That's why I like that song that Rudy and Jenny used to sing. It's broken and spilled out. In other words, when Christ died on that cross, he was broken and spilled out for how many? All. Everyone. And he knew that some of those would never what? Yeah, never choose him, never accept the gift there. So that's just why... Uh, so we don't fully understand all of this stuff, but we have to realize that whenever you have free will, there is a certain amount of limiting to the sovereignty that God has there, that he was willing to lay aside. That's part of agape love, see. Right. Mm -hmm. that, that's our biggest problem is, as humans, we blame God. And remember, the blame game started in the garden. That's where it started. You know, Eve blamed, uh, you know, God, why did you make this serpent? See, she was blaming God. Adam comes along and says, well, God, why did you make this woman? See, he was blaming God. And that's where it all starts. It all goes back to blaming God. We have to come to the place in our growth in Christ where we cease to do that, folks. We choose life instead of death. Yes, we choose life instead of death. We choose light instead of darkness. In other words, we do not blame God. We may not understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't understand him. He is so far above and beyond us. That's why he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. He says that in Isaiah. You see, because he is uh, above and beyond something. So these are some of these issues. This, the question of suffering. See, there, there is no way that we're ever going to come to a complete, settled answer on this, at least this side of heaven. Maybe after the consummation takes place, it might be possible. But this side of heaven, we will never fully understand uh, this area of suffering. The, I like the way Paul does it, and that is, how Paul does it is that um, what the head does, we do. Christ suffered, we suffer in him. In other words, we are joined with the head. The body is joined to the head and what Christ went through, we go through. So Christ never exempted himself from our suffering. In fact, the Godhead was in our suffering from all eternity. That's the way I, I, I can understand that. In other words, when, when Christ was on that cross, where was God the Father? He was right there. He was right there on the cross. And when we are in suffering, whether we see it or not, where is he? Right there. Because what did, what did Christ tell when he, when he was dividing the sheep and the goats? You have done it unto the least of these. You have done it to me. When Paul was persecuting the church and killing uh, believers and going around and doing this, when Christ arrested him and showed him his glory and blinded him, what did Jesus say to Paul? Why are you 
kicking against the pricks. Why are you persecuting me? Was Paul physically, in reality, persecuting Jesus Christ? No. He was persecuting the believers. And in persecuting the believers, he was persecuting Jesus Christ. And so there's, there's that connection there that the Bible makes very clear on that. And it's important to, to see that. Okay, this glory that's going to be revealed, it's going to be something that we're not just going to be uh, on the sidelines watching. It's going to be something that we are going to share in. We are going to participate in this glory. This glory is not only going to be revealed in Jesus Christ, it is going to be revealed in you and I. Jesus Christ shone like the sun on the Mount of Transfiguration. One day, folks, you and I are going to shine like the sun. We are going to have that kind of light about us, that kind of glory about us, is what the Bible brings out. It will be a real thing that we actually share in that we will be partakers of this glory. And then, um, so we'll be part of this, we will share in this. And so that's why Paul says that our light affliction, which is but for a moment, this is what he wants us to understand, that it's just, uh, that doesn't mean that our suffering isn't heavy, it's real heavy. But when you compare it with the glory that is coming, it's like a feather, is what Paul is saying, uh, in comparison. And that's why uh, next week we'll talk more about this. When you're looking at the scales, the Christian looks at both sides of the scale. In other words, one, one side of the scale is his very, very, very heavy suffering. And the other side of the scale is something that is much, 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 much heavier. And that's the future glory. And when you look from this side of the scale to that side of the scale, all of a sudden this side of the scale looks like nothing in comparison. And that's the analogy that Paul is, is using in regards to that. So, let me see. And when we think of eternity, remember, where does the eternal life start? It starts right now. The moment you accept your position in God's Son, Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Again, that is realized eschatology. That should be consummated eschatology, but it is realized eschatology because you have that eternal life right now. And nobody can take that eternal life away. And Jesus made that very clear in chapter 10 of John. Let's go there real quick. Chapter 10 of John. Uh, let me find the verses here. Yes. Starting with verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. It's a beautiful promise, folks. When you look at that, a very beautiful promise. Don't hear that talked about too often, but that's scripture, folks. It's a scripture promise. So our time is up. So next week we're going to start looking at verse 19 and Romans 8. And we're going to start looking at this creation that's going to be talked about here. And we're going to find out that this creation is not humans and that this creation is not angels. So it's a, Paul is 
bringing this out in this verse. It is not uh, angels and it's not human beings. It's something else. I have a little picture here of that. And one of the things that Paul tells us is that the creation is eagerly waiting with eager expectation. That means uh, stretching your neck as far as you can stretch your neck is what it means. And that's what the creation is doing, looking with eager expectation to our glory. When we are glorified, they're looking to the fact of when we are glorified. That's what they're looking for. So next week we're going to talk about that. On that. <clears throat> Any questions on this? Okay, let's bow our heads for prayer as we close. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful story of love, of your great love for us, for this wonderful plan of salvation that you inaugurated at the cross and that one day you will bring it to its full and complete and final absolute end. And we just thank you for that. And, that, and as we live our life now, we know and we rest assured that we are in you and that you will take us all the way through. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.